I mean, we had Kathleen talking about, uh, you know, that additional 25 basis point cut. I mean, can we continue easing without fiscal stimulus coming in at some point? You're raising the right question. Um, you and I both heard Mario Draghi's speech last week where he said there needs to be more balance between monetary policy and fiscal policy, and I think that's absolutely right. Um, Jay Powell is conscious of that, and um, I don't assume that the Fed is going to continue to go ahead on easing unless there's real reasons for it. It's a very thoughtful group. Uh, it's a diversified group, as you know, and they have various types of opinions. But um, there's a lot of focus on the Fed, and perhaps more so than the Fed would like, given uh, the president and how the president has elevated, if you will, the whole decision-making process. Uh, I think there's so much reliance. There's never been as much reliance on the Fed and subtle banks than ever before. Uh, that's a fair assessment to make. And the more the market wants, the more the Fed is under pressure to give. But let's put this in historical context. I think one of the things we, we've begun to rely on monetary policy really as a result of the fact that in 2008, the Fed, the Bank of England, the, uh, the PBOC, the Bank of Japan, and the uh, EBD all worked together in lockstep. And that was a very positive outcome. And the, what we know is that the Great Recession could have been the Great Depression Mark II here. And as a result, um, the world has become to rely on monetary policy. We've, we've lived in this sort of warm bath of monetary policy for the last 10 years. Uh, but it's perhaps, it's, it's run its course. And we now need a much more uh, thoughtful set of uh, options, particularly when you look at the big economies of the world, and it's less so in the United States where real population growth is still there. But when you look at Japan and now you look at the demographics of Germany, one of the reasons why the German economy is slowing down, one is China, China trade, but the other is also the German economy's demographic is uh, declining, and therefore sources of GDP growth are declining. So we've got to look at other factors in terms of workforce, job creation, demographics, capital investment, infrastructure, things like that, as well as a broader, more transparent, and I say transparent fiscal policy. For the Fed, are rates closer to neutral? What do you mean by neutral? Neutral. I mean, is it where it wants to be? I think the Fed is, um, some people might say this is a mid-cycle adjustment where we are right now. Uh, but the cycle is perhaps continuing longer than uh, people had expected based on precedent. We've always relied historically on precedents of cycles being approximately sort of six to nine years. And this cycle, of course, has continued well beyond uh, a decade. Um, so I'm not sure um, that we can do anything other than look carefully. I think the Fed is going to look at this again in the fourth quarter. And whether it's October or December, you're clearly there is the anticipation from an insurance adjusted point of view of, a, of another rate adjustment. But anticipation, you know, even the tone of the last Fed meeting was such that there was an element of it being at one point uh, more dovish and then the data would suggest that perhaps it had become more hawkish. So uh, the jury's out and let's just, let's respect the fact that the, you know, I worked a lot with the Fed in 2008 during the restructuring of AIG and I've got to tell you it is one of the most impressive groups of people professionally in terms of training, discipline, and analysis. So I think we have to keep that in mind. You're not dealing with a, a group of people who just sit in a room and punt. It's a very rigorous uh, group of people in terms of analysis and thought. John, there's a trend developing, 15, 16 trillion dollars in negative yielding bonds. Are you concerned? And when you take a look at yield, is it a one-way bet down? Um, I think there's a great debate around the world about the role of negative interest rates. Um, obviously, you've had, you have uh, a lot of economies that have had negative interest rates like Japan, uh, Switzerland, and a number of others in Europe. Um, I think it's, uh, it's a question of whether it's going to be necessary, but it's also a question of whether it's politically acceptable. And I think we have to remember the politics of negative interest rates in many parts of the world wouldn't necessarily be well understood or embraced. On the other hand, as an asset manager, 
it's all a question of relative performance. It's a question of what you can do in a bank versus what you can do with other, other instruments. One of the things that's interesting right now, you have to remember, is PIMCO is all about active management. PIMCO is all about looking at things daily from a macro perspective. So um, people are going to be faced probably certainly more and more with focusing more on how they're going to manage their short-term liquidity and yield uh, an, what we call an alpha-generated return. So tell us, what's looking attractive at this point? Uh, I think let's, uh, in the last, what's looking attractive? I'm not a pundit. I'm not going to... Um, I'm not going to go there in this conversation. I think there's a lot of things in transition over the last couple of days. Um, there's a lot of things, you know, you still have a lot of interest in certain um, credits, more mid-cap uh, private credits, not large cap, um, in, the, in the private debt space, more in the alternative space, less liquid space. Uh, you still have certain real estate uh, private debt vehicles that are very credible, very uh, competitive, uh, but that's just two examples. How do you view the slowdown in China and how that will play out in the markets? Uh, China is uh, interesting and I think we have to be careful not to... Um, um, Donald Trump is a master at, uh, at, at drawing the media's attention to everything he says and does. And he's, you know, he, he, a textbook will be written one day on how, how clever he is. He's really very clever at it. China, of course, has a lot of complexities and this trade debate between America and China is, is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the broader discussion between China and the United States. But, you know, I'm, I'm a great fan of the Chinese government's ability to solve their problems. Um, I've spent a lot of time there and the acumen and the experience and the expertise in all aspects, whether it's the upper echelons, the middle, the lower echelons of China and the Chinese government, regionally and centrally, very impressive. People are in the job based on their previous experience. It's a very meritocratic group. So there, there clearly is people looking at growth at 6%, maybe going to 5.5%, 5%. This morning, depending on oil prices, there's a concern that as oil prices potentially become more volatile or rise when you have a higher risk premium, that may bring down the, the uh, Chinese economy down to the 4 to 4.5% range. Having said that, it's a big economy, still growing at a big number, but don't... Uh, I would keep the faith in the, the Chinese have a lot of um, expertise in their toolkit and um, uh, don't rule them out. They, they take a long view, as they have in history, about this, this uh, number of issues they're dealing with right now. And it, I think we should remember they've got not just the trade issue, they've got the Hong Kong issue, they've also got the um, swine flu issue in terms of their pork supply. So they've got a lot of issues they're dealing with. but they're. They're very confident at dealing with these issues.